All right, let's go through lab number one. So this is ERT 405, PLC part two, lab number one, UDTs and standard logic. So we are gonna learn how to create UDTs, user-defined data types, and use them in a program today. So this is what our machine is going to look like. This can be found all on Blackboard. Uh, so we are going to go through the steps here, how to create a UDT, and then how to use that in our logic. So you can follow along with there, follow along with this video, and follow along with the professor in the lab class. So let's have a look at our factory I.O. machine. So this is very familiar to you. We've seen this one a couple times already in labs from 303. So we basically have a pusher, a second pusher, boxes are going to travel down here, get pushed onto the second conveyor, move along, get pushed onto the third conveyor. Uh, we have a photo eye here that detects if a box is a certain height. And if we detect it with that photo eye, we will push it. Same thing over here. Uh, simple controls on our panel. Just a start stop push button with an e-stop and pretty simple uh, start stop e-stop buttons, a photo eye, second photo eye, advanced return proximity switches for the pushers, lights for our start stop buttons, a whole bunch of motors for the conveyors, and then just a single solenoid to advance each of the pushers. That is all of our I.O. So that is the machine. So let's look at how we are going to write this logic. So I have a blank uh, PLC program that we're going to use. It can be found on Blackboard. It is not that one. find the correct one here if we want to get the let's just take a second to open up so we're going to learn how to create the UDT which is probably going to take up a good chunk of our time uh, creating these UDTs takes a while but once you have them done you'll figure out that they are well worth the effort that you put into creating them all right there we go so this is our blank file. Now we are going to do this programming. Initially, we're going to do it in an offline mode because there's things here that are just a lot easier to do offline than they are to do online. Close down some windows. All right, so the first thing we're going to do here is create our UDT. So to create a UDT, that is under Assets over here, and you'll see this thing called Data Types. And this first thing here is called User Defined. So there is nothing showing up in there right now, but if I do a right click on there, you'll see that I have New Data Type. That's one of my options here. So I'm gonna click on New Data Type, and I'll get this window that comes up and this is where I can start creating a new data type. So just follow along with what I'm going to create here. I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to call it UDT. You can name this whatever you want, but you're going to want to be able to find this in a list later. And I'm going to give you another little cheat here. I'm going to put an underscore at the beginning of that. When things get listed alphabetically, underscore is the first character that comes up alphabetically. So if you put an underscore in, at the beginning of something, it always appears at the top of your alphabetical order list. So that is a little trick that I like to do uh, to help out with 
getting things to come up uh, very quickly. And I accidentally opened this a bunch of times, so I'm going to close them all down. Keep on going here. So now we have a bunch of columns here. First one is going to say name. We're going to click on here and so we're going to put in our names. So my first element that I'm going to add or member of the UDT is going to be the advance clear. This is a Boolean and the description on this. Now the reason we're going to put descriptions on these is because these will automatically show up in your comments, which makes these very nice to use. And we're going to call that clear to advance. The next one, advance PB. You'll notice that I'm keeping these names fairly short and abbreviated. So they don't take up a whole lot of room uh, on your logic. Now to keep track of exactly what they are, That is what we have the description for. So we can be very descriptive descriptive over here, but we want to keep these names nice and short. The advanced command. The advanced output. Advanced complete. That is a Boolean as well. And the advanced fault. Oops. And the advance fault timer. This one is actually a timer. The type is timer. All right, so that is all of our elements for the advance motion. We need to repeat all these for the return motion. So one way you can do this, I don't think you can copy all of them, but you can copy one line at a time. And I'm basically just gonna say, change these to return. Copy this one. A lot of this course is going to be about how do we quickly replicate, copy and paste and change. Copy, paste, search and replace things so that we can create a lot of logic quickly and correctly.
spelled advance wrong on that one. And the last one, return fault timer. All right, so once we have this done, we can come back here later and add to this UDT or change it or do anything else we want to do to it later. Uh, one thing you can't do is you can't do that while you are online. This can only be edited. You can create UDTs while you're online, but you can't edit existing ones or make changes to existing UDTs while you're online. That can only be done offline. So we do this, we hit apply, and you'll see that we now have over here this UDT advanced return as a new data type that we have created now. So I'm going to say OK. And now let's start programming. So we have three different routines we're going to use in our program. So I'm in the main routine right now. So let's create our routines. So we're going to go over here under main program, say new routine. We're going to create one that's called cycle. We're going to create one that's called pusher one. And one that's called pusher two. And now we know that the main routine is scanned automatically all the time. The only thing we're going to do from there is jump to our other routines. So we are going to add a JSR in here. The easiest way to do that is just go out here and just type JSR. And the JSR command will come up automatically. And we want this to, we're going to select cycle from there. And now let's copy and paste that twice and make this one pusher one and this one pusher two. So there we have that. Let's document as we go here. So let's put in a run comment. there so we get a little I guess we don't get a space so that should be all of our logic for our main routine now let's go to we'll come back to the cycle logic later let's do our logic for pusher number one so this is our standard logic that we are going to write over and over and over again but really once you write it once it should just be a matter of copying and pasting it from a reference after that. So let's look at what this is. But you should be, this is your first time writing it. You are going to become very, very familiar with this structure because this is how we're going to write all of our programs from now on. So first line is the clear line. So our output here. Actually, what I'm going to do, let's create a couple of lines here. And we'll just define what these outputs actually are. So the first line is the clear. So we are going to create a tag that is called pusher1. That is going to be a new tag. We're going to create the logic for pusher1 right now. So it is currently undefined. So let's create that new pusher one tag. So we've gone through this process before creating tags. Under data type, it's not going to be a Boolean this time though. We were actually going to use our UDT that we created. So if you look at the list of all the different data types that are available to you here, you can see that they're all listed alphabetically. If you go to the very top of that list, you'll now see 
because we put that underscore there, the very first one at the top of the list is UDT advanced return. So that is the new data type that we created. We are going to select that as our data type. And then we're going to hit create. Now, this now has a structure associated with it. So let's click on here again. So pusher one, and then what we're going to do to get to all the sub elements of that, or all the members of it, we're going to say dot. So push the dot. And then you'll see we have all of these different possibilities that are now created as members of the pusher one tag. So pusher one has all these elements below it. So the one that we want is pusher one advanced clear, which is that one. And you'll see that that tag actually traveled with it uh, from the UDT. So that clear to advance comes with it. Now, what you'll notice if we double click on the comment, there is actually nothing here because it doesn't actually show that. But what, what we can do here is we are going to type in pusher one and then hit, hit apply. You'll notice that it changes this to pusher one. Now we don't want that. Let's do this again. Let's say pusher one, enter. Oh, let's get rid of this. Let's delete this. Say okay. Get back to clear to advance. Let me get back here. Let's edit the pusher one properties. We want to call this pusher one in the description field right here. You'll now see it says pusher one clear to advance. So whatever we typed in as the general description for the pusher one tag shows up first. And then this comes from the member description. So this is how we're going to do all of our descriptions from now on. Now I'm going to come back here and what I like to do is when we said pusher one, I'm going to hit enter after that and advance down to the next line. You see how I did that. So pusher one, enter, cursors on the next line, hit apply. And you'll see now how that arranges. So pusher one is always on the top line by itself. And then the next line of text is clear to advance. That is the text that is part of the UDT. Okay, so that is how we want to do our comments. And the comments should come up automatically for us now. We don't need to go back and document these again later. They should all just show up like that. All right, so our next line is going to be the advance command. So I'm going to drag this address down here. And this one is going to be advance command right there. The next line is the advance output. The next line is going to be the advance complete. The next line is going to be the, this one is actually a latch but it is the advance fault. And then the next one after that is also the advance fault, but it is an unlatch for that. All right, so that is what each line is for. I'm gonna put a run comment on here as well. We're gonna call this Pusher one, advanced logic. All right, so what else goes on these lines? 
we are clear to advance. We need to have a couple things here. The one thing that's always going to be automatic is as long as we do not have pusher one advance fault. So not pusher one advance fault. And then this next one here, I'm actually going to create another tag. And it's going to be called add logic here. So why am I creating a tag called add logic here? And I'm going to put a description on here that says replace this with logic to be figured out later. So this is basically going to serve as a placeholder for when we don't know exactly what needs to go in here, but we know that there is something that needs to go in here. So we will just put this here for now as a reminder that we need to come back to this and figure it out later. This next line is going to look like this. So this is our advance command. We get the advance command. We need to have the advance clear. And then we have two different branches here. One is the manual branch. So if we are in manual mode, and I'm going to put a description on there. So it says manual mode. And this one here is going to be auto mode. So in manual mode, if we were to push the advanced push button, that would give us the advanced command. In auto mode, there will be some conditions that need to be met in order for us to advance. Now, we will have to figure out what those are a bit later, but we know that there's something that needs to go in here. So we're just going to leave this bit in its place. And we'll know later on that has that this has to get replaced by something else. Now the nice thing is we can go do a cross reference and search for that bit and come up with all the different places where we've left that bit and make sure before we run our program that we have replaced all of those with actual logic later on. And we should not be able to find that bit later on. Okay, so that is the advanced command line. Let's move on to the next one. This is the output. And this one is going to say if we have the advanced command and we do not have the return command, which is the opposite command, that should give us advance out. And also, we will seal with that. And we, but we will only seal if we have actually completed the motion. So we'll do that. And this is where we'll also use our real output. So we're going to put our real output here as well. I'm not sure what the real output is at this point. So again, I'm just going to put the add logic here bit. And basically what I'm doing is I'm creating some generic logic that we'll use for all of our motions that makes it easy to copy and paste. And then we can go back and fill in all the correct information later. All right.
this one, our advance complete. What defines advance complete? Well, it depends on what the motion is. We'll have to look at that depending on the motion. So for right now, we're just going to say add logic here. And then we do have some pretty generic things that define the fault. This is going to be And one thing you're going to find when we talk about this logic is you might see some differences between the way that uh, I would do things and the way that Professor Andrew Bucky would do things. Now, they are both correct, but there just be, might be slight variations on how to execute these logics, this logic, and it's just, just little differences in programming style. Okay, and that is completely okay. So for example, one of the things that I like to do, this is our fault timer. One of the things that I like to do with a timer like this is I will use a move instruction. to move a value into the preset of this timer. Now the reason I like to do that is because when I copy and paste this, that value will travel with it. So this is basically going to populate that preset with a 5000, which is five seconds. And it also makes it so no one can easily change that value as well. So this is the way that I will do timers a lot of the time. Uh, that might not be the way that Professor Bucky does it, but either is okay. I just find this makes things easier when you're copying and pasting logic because you don't end up with a, a zero value in here and have to go around and set these all. Okay, so this basically says if you have given the advanced output, but you have not reached the complete position within five seconds, we're going to trigger a fault and that fault is actually going to latch in place. to reset these faults. We're going to create a fault reset bit. And that should be our completed logic for the pusher one advance. Now, here is where we get creative. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six lines of logic for pusher one advance. So let's do the logic for pusher one return. So instead of keying all this in again, we're gonna do this in only a couple of seconds. So we are going to go out in the margin here and select so hold down your shift and arrow key. I'm going to select all six lines of the logic here, and then I'm going to do a copy and then a paste. So I've now copied and pasted that logic, the advanced logic. So I now have it twice in here. Now what I want to do is I want to change all of this logic here to the return logic instead. So I'm going to place my cursor right here. It makes a difference where you place your cursor, so place it right here. Before this, place it right here. I'm going to say Control H. Control H is search and replace. You can also do this from up here. Replace. Now it makes a difference what we do here. 
we want to make sure that we are traveling in the down direction. That means we're going to travel from this way downward. We want to make sure that our wrap is off. That means that once we get to the bottom of the routine, we'll just stop. We will not continue at the top and continue to move down. And we want to make sure that we are in the current routine. So that means we are only searching and replacing within pusher one. So we're not doing the entire program just within pusher one. We need to be very cautious of what we are actually replacing. So we want to replace the word ADV with RET. And what that is going to do, it's going to search all these tags and wherever it sees ADV, it's going to replace it with RET. Now, we'll do this one in a controlled way. We will just say find next and it's just going to go through and we actually have to push this every time to make the replacement. Okay, so find next, and then we say replace. Does this one replace, replace, and you can see what it's doing here. It's changing that to return. So now this is my pusher one return fault, pusher one clear to return, clear to return. So I'm going to say replace, 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 replace. I'm going to keep on going here. I'm just pushing each one, so it actually has to get my acknowledgement to make the replacement. And now we are at the bottom, so it will actually be complete now because we've hit the bottom of the... We won't be able to find anything else because we're actually at the bottom. Okay, so that now replaced all of this logic here with the word return. Now the one thing that it will not fix on this line here, the output line, remember that we already had return in here because we have our return command and then we have whatever the opposite command would be right here. So this should be return and advance. So we actually have to manually change this one to say advance like that. All right. But that is all of our pusher one logic now complete. Now what we want to do, that is our pusher one logic. Let's also change this comment. Now let's copy all 12 lines of this. Do a copy, go over to our pusher two routine and do a paste. Again, we are going to go to the top of this routine. Again, do a search and replace. And now what I want to do is replace pusher one with pusher two. Again, do not wrap around, move in the down direction. And this time, instead of hitting the button every time, I'm just gonna say replace all. You have to be very cautious when you're doing this. Make sure these settings are correct. You're just not going to replace everything within your entire program. But I'm just going to say replace all. And it's going to go like this. Make all these replacements. And it will tell you in the end it replaced 36 occurrences. If this came up and said it replaced 838 occurrences, you know that something weird happened. Uh, but 36 sounds like a reasonable number for what it found in here. Now, you'll notice here, no comments. This looks weird. We got a lot of errors everywhere. Why is that? Well, it's because the pusher to tag is an undefined tag at this point. So let's actually create that tag. Let's call this pusher two, advance our cursor down to the next line and our type for this. Again, it's gonna be the data type, which is our UDT. Say okay and create. 
And now all of our comments appeared, all of our errors go away, and we now have complete logic for pusher number two. Let's change this comment and change this comment. And that is our pusher two logic. All right, so if I do a search for these, add logic here's. These are used in a bunch of places. So you'll see there's a bunch of those that we need to address and actually put some logic in for those. But we've got the bulk of our logic created now for pusher one and two. Let's move along. Let's go to our cycle routine. And let's start looking at this. And I'm actually going to move over to here at this point. So let's start putting together our machine cycle here. So let's call this, I'm going to say this is run. That tag is already created, which is nice. So run mode, I've got a start, start PB. And then I've also got a couple of other things here. I've got a stop PB. I have an e-stop. And the other thing we're actually going to use in here, we're going to start using this factory IO running. We actually get a bit from factory IO that tells us whether it's running or not. We will use that in here. So you can see this. Actually, what I'll do here, let's download this. We'll do the rest of this online. So we can test as we go from this point on. I'm going to get some duplicate bit for add logic here because I used add logic here in multiple places. We'll fix those as we go. So we can see things running at this point. So that is I'm going to stop that. There we go. We're actually connected. All right. So you'll see that bit there, the factory IO running. That actually is connected to this. So if we are running, that will actually go. So there's our run mode. I think this was just left with the motors going. So let's actually connect run mode to our motors. So it's called conveyor motor. There's nine conveyor motors altogether. We remember that the way we do this is add branch level. So it's one A, one B. One C. Two A, two 
to be to Z three A and three B. Three B and three C. Okay. There we go. So we now have control over the motors or through that. Good. All right. Let's add a couple more things in here. Let's say that if we are in run mode, and this is, this is going to be a simplified version of the cycle logic. So two things we're going to do here. We're going to say if we are in run, then we're going to say that we are in auto mode. And start PBLT is the light. And if we are not in run mode, we're going to say that is manual. We are not going to do anything with auto and manual today. Or at least nothing with manual mode. But we need to have it for our logic to function properly. Uh, let's also say that if we... Also, if we are not in run mode, that is going to do a fault reset. Okay, so you can see that light now travels with it. And let's put some run comments on here. All right, so let's look at, we've got now, I believe all the conveyors are running. Visually, they look like they are all spinning. I think that is correct. All right, so let's look at this machine and figure out how we should program the auto sequences of it. So let's look at pusher number one. Now we need to go up here, look at everywhere where we did, where we said add logic here, and figure out what does that add logic actually need to be. Okay, so on the clear line, this basically represents, is there anything where we can damage the machine 
by advancing this. Is there anything this runs into? Anything we need to make sure is out of the way? Or any obstacles like that? So in this case, that pusher, it's pretty free to move in the advanced direction. It doesn't harm anything. There's nothing that it interferes with. So really, as long as we are not faulted, that is the only condition to say that we should be clear. So there's nothing else that needs to be added there. We'll just remove that. That piece is done. This one, what makes this advance in auto? We will have to come back to that one. That's probably the most complicated thing on here. Uh, this one here, this would be the actual output. What makes us advance? So what is the actual physical real output that does that? In this case, That is going to be a real device. We have something here called Pusher 1 Advanced Solenoid. That is our real device. I'm going to put a description on this as well. That is what causes the actual motion to happen. So that is what goes in there. Here we have pusher one, advance complete. So what defines that we have actually completed this motion? So there is two devices on here. We have pusher one, advance proximity switch and pusher one, return proximity switch that actually tell us the position of the pusher. So in this case, if we have pusher one advanced prox, that needs to be on to tell us that we are advanced. And we should also just double check and make sure the pusher one return prox should be off in that condition as well. We do the combination of these just to verify that we are, our switches are working properly. And that is it for all the logic there. Let's go through the return as well. Again, what makes this clear to return? There's no obstructions there. So we'll get rid of this. Is there a physical output that makes us return? There actually isn't. This is a single solenoid device. There is no output for return. So we can just remove this. That's all we need to do there. What defines us as returned? Pusher one return prox and not the pusher one advance prox. And this is the basic process we will do when we create these motions is then go back and figure out what needs to go in place of all the add logic here spots. All right, so I still have this one. I'm going to do a search again on this. So you'll see there are fewer add logic here bits now than there was before. Let's go into pusher number two. Looking over here at pusher two. Again, on the clear, there is no additional conditions for the clear. We'll come back to the auto. The advance. Pusher to advance solenoid makes the motion happen. The complete. What are our feedback switches? Switches. Pusher to advanced proximity switch 
and not the return proximity switch. Let's do the same for the return logic. Nothing obstructs the return. There is no solenoid for the return, so we can just get rid of that. It's a single solenoid motion. And again, pusher to return proximity switch. Pusher to advanced proximity switch. Not on gives us that as well. Let's assemble that stuff. Let's go back to our cross reference. Let's do a refresh on this and see how many things are left. There's only four conditions now for the add logic here that we need to replace. So it's basically these advance commands, advance and return commands in auto. So what makes this move in auto? Let's look at pusher number one. So we have a photo eye here. So let's start with this. Let's say, I believe that is called photo I1. Let's say if we did that. Okay, that's not correct. For one thing, it is the, these photo eyes are the reflective kind. So this has to be the normally closed version of them. Let's make that change. Let's try this. Okay, so the problem is that photo eye is located before the pusher. So we need to See how that goes way too early. So we need to detect that there is a part transitioning. So let's see that there's a part coming. Remember that there's a part transitioning. Give it a time delay and then kick it over. That's what we need to do. So we're actually going to do some logic over in, let's do it at the end of the cycle routine. Let's create a line here. Let's put a tag on it, call it. Pusher one parts. And let's actually say that when we don't see the photo eye, which means that there's a part there, let's remember that there's a part coming. 
So let's use a latch. Now I'm going to keep my tag names short so they don't take up too much space on the rung. But I'm going to be descriptive in the description of them. I'm going to say this is part approaching pusher one. That is a boolean. So let's lock that in. So the part is approaching pusher number one. When that happens, let's give it a time delay. And when that time delay expires, That expires, let's say, part at pusher one. Part at pusher one to be pushed. Now that was a latch, so we need to unlatch at that at some point. And let's say we will unlatch that once we have actually extended that pusher and that. We have a bit that is defined by that. That is pusher one advance complete. So what this is saying now, we see a part, we latch this in, we wait a little bit, let's call this two seconds. Once that two seconds expires, we're gonna say there's a part at the pusher. Once we've actually pushed, we're gonna unlatch this bit here. And then this bit here, part at pusher one, let's use that as our auto condition. So that is what's gonna trigger us to move while we're in auto. So part is at pusher one. What is gonna make us move what is going to make us return automatically? Let's say we don't have a part at pusher one, then we will return. So we'll either be doing one or the other. Let's assemble all that stuff. Let's watch it go. All right, so is it functioning properly? Yes, it is, but it's too slow. So two seconds is too long. So the part is already passed it by the time that the So 
two seconds is too long of a time. Let's try one and a half seconds. That also appears to be too long. It's just catching the back end of the part. Let's try one second. That looks pretty good there. Let's try 800. I think that looks too early. Let's try 1000 again. All right, so that is 1000. Let's try this same logic. Let's just duplicate this. We need the same type of logic for pusher two. Hopefully our naming conventions were good enough that this stuff should just changing ones to twos. Again, because I'm online, I can't do this automatically, but there's not a whole lot. I can do them pretty quickly. Just like this. Uh, this, I need to create a tag for that. All right, so I've got that logic there. Let's go over to pusher two. Part at pusher two. And here. return when I don't have that. Let's assemble all of this. Now we should be able to see now if I go back to my cross reference. This is my cross reference for the add logic here bit. If I refresh on this now, You'll see I don't have any entries, so there is no add logic here bits left in the program. That's good. So all my placeholders have been replaced by actual logic. And let's see what's going on over here at Pusher 2. So that looks like it's working. It might be a little bit a little bit late maybe.
let's watch this one. I think that's a little bit late. Let's trigger this a bit earlier. Let's see how it does on this box. I think that's still a bit late. This is at 900, 800, sorry. That's pretty good. Let's see if it can go earlier. 700. That one hits it pretty good. So 700 looks like a pretty good value for that. And just do a reset on here. And that looks like a system that is running pretty well. So let's look at our logic. So we've got our run mode, all of our conveyors. Auto manual mode in the lights, fault reset, pusher one parts, pusher two parts, pusher one advanced logic. And what you'll notice and what is good for all of this logic, all of the advanced return logic is the same everywhere other than the little unique bits of it, which are basically what goes here with the auto. What is the actual real addresses here and here? And was there anything extra that we needed to put in up here for that clear to advance portion? There's our return logic. That is our advance return for pusher two. And that is it. That is our completed system. All right, so that is it for lab number one. Complete part one, complete part two, complete part three, which is basically getting your program to work for part three. Part two is, so part one is creating your UDT. Part two is creating your program structure. Part three is programming it so it works. That is it for the lab. Complete that, get checked off. And that is it for today.